So, um, welcome to all of you to this, this first lecture and discussion session in the Understanding Anger series. Um, I'd like to thank the Kingston Library for once again you know, hosting these discussions and uh, uh, they've you know, created a, a space here where we can do this month after month after month. This is the second year of monthly lectures at the Kingston Library. And the goal is to bring something that will be of some general interest, but also intellectual stimulation and engagement with, with text. Thank you. Um, so I, many of you know me already. I'm, I'm Greg Sadler. I'm a local Kingston resident. Um, I'm a philosophy professor. I do some writing, some public speaking, and also some philosophical counseling. Um, the theme for this particular series, as you can see, in the, uh, the handout with all the talks, is understanding anger. So each month we're going to focus on one classic perspective on, on, on this emotion, and we're gonna look at ancient texts and medieval texts um, that deal with this. So some of them are, are literature, as you can see. We actually begin and we end with literature, but in between we're gonna have quite a bit of philosophy and even some, some religious and theological texts as well, because um, there's a lot of interesting discussions and insights about anger that we can find in this, this older literature. So the format for these talks is going to be a little bit different than what we did for the Existentialism series. There we blocked out about an hour and a half. Um, I would come in, you know, with some, some prepared stuff. We'd usually get into some side discussions, which we're still going to do as well. But this time we're going to try to reserve uh, the last half an hour for just total open forum discussion about these, these sorts of things. We can do Q&A if, if you want to. We can also just you know, pick some topics. If, you, if you know, there isn't a lot of discussion, I've always got extra material that I can, I can bring up as well. Um, I'm going to give you handouts every, every time. And uh, I'll also, as I get more organized, be providing you with lists of suggested a primary reading and even some, some good secondary texts on, on these matters. Um, we video record these, these lectures like we're doing right now. Uh, that's, that's the heater. Uh, nothing to be done about that. At least, we're not, at least we're not in the other room where it sounds like we're in some spiritualist session with you know, rapping on the table because of the, the thing. So we, we video record these lectures and I upload them to my YouTube channel in part for, for people who aren't able to attend these sessions. So if you miss a session, you can always catch up. Um, you can even participate by putting comments if you want to. Um, but I also have a, a quite literally worldwide audience on my YouTube channel. So this is a way that I am able to provide um, resources for them. And... Um, We'll, we'll see where, where this goes. Now, this particular topic, a few of you, I think, were there at the session where we actually took a vote about what the next lecture series ought to be. So if, if somebody asked me, well, why are you focusing on this? I have a ready excuse, which is, well, I, you know, I left it up to a vote, and this is what the people voted. <laughs> but that's, that's not really uh, an excuse, because I was the one who actually came in with four to five options and said, which ones of these do you want? So that's kind of stacking the deck a bit. Um, the bigger answer is that I'm interested in anger itself and how it works, and I'm very interested in, in uh, texts where we find some, some useful understanding or some depiction about anger. It's very prevalent today. They have anger yeah. management. They do, and, and it's interesting. Some of the anger management stuff that turns out to be quite useful is very similar to what we find in Aristotle or we find in Epictetus. Um, but, the, you know, usually they've, they've lost any, any sight of that. And a lot of the discussions about anger that I see carried on tend to be uh, less well-informed than some of these classical discussions, perhaps in part because, um, you know, it, it's easier for us in some respects, to insulate ourselves from the effects of other people's anger or, or our own. In ancient Greece, in, in, you know, out in the Egyptian desert where these monks were living, you were stuck with these people living next to you, and <laughs> anger had some, some really immediate effects. Um, now, I'm also working on some projects connected with anger. I'm working on a book specifically on Aristotle's theory of anger because he talks about it quite a bit, and he's one of the classic... 
um, theorists. But I'm also working on a book that this, this larger series fits into, um, sort of going through chapter by chapter these different perspectives on, on anger in classical and, and medieval thinkers. Um, and I'm also doing some work on Stoic philosophy and anger and anger in, in Christian thought. So this is, this is a topic that I've been thinking about for quite a while. In, and in part because I, I've been, you know, throughout my life a pretty angry person. I got in a lot of trouble as a kid for not managing my anger well. Um, did you too? How many, uh, how many of you got in trouble, like serious trouble as kids for... Not too many of them. My teacher threw a ruler at me. Yeah, I, I ended up becoming a ward of the court uh, at one point in my my teen years because I, I couldn't manage my anger. But didn't they ever say it was healthy to get rid of your anger? It wasn't in my case. You know, <laughs> Not the I, I, dealing with it. Yeah, and that's actually one of the good um, <laughs> topics that we'll keep looking at. There's this there's this theory that they call the discharge theory that says that. Well, you know, anger is kind of like this built-up uh, reservoir, and you just got to find a healthy outlet for it. And some of the research that that has been done shows us that that's not really the case. It, it, it really depends on when you're doing it, how you're doing it, because it can tend to, to build the anger response even more. Uh, and that aligns perfectly with what people like Plato and Aristotle and Epictetus told us. Um, now... This time we're starting with these Greek poets, and it's a good question why begin with Homer or um, Sophocles, these these Greek um, epic writers and tragedians. So one answer that we can give to that is historically focused. We can say if we want to do this the right way chronologically, like a you know college class would be, then we got to start at the beginning and we got to finish at the end, you know. And, you know, that makes sense. The, the poets have thought out some things with respect to anger, and they are going to influence the later thinkers. Like, um, you know, Plato is going to have Socrates bring up lines from Homer. So it kind of makes sense. You know, you begin with the, the first documents, then go to the, the later ones. Um, a more flippant answer would be, yeah? Any definition of anger? Not at this point. Um, there will be a couple um, different definitions given of anger as we go through. Like Aristotle has, has a definition. The Stoics have a definition. If you, if you had to have one handy, um, I think one of the reasons why they don't try to define it early on is they figure, well, we all experience it. We all know what it is. Aristotle defined it among other places, as uh, a desire for retaliation or for setting things right provoked by um, perceived injustice. And that tends to run through most of the literature. Um, there's, there's other things that could be added to that, and they will, but the, the idea is that anger doesn't just involve, like, totally losing your cool, there's some sort of cause for it, and that cause has to do with our perceptions of right and wrong. You know, I'm, I'm wrongly treated, so therefore I get angry. If I'm rightly treated, and I actually recognize it as being right, like, you know, when I get punished, I, I had a case just recently where I had, a, I had to, you know, punish a kid for plagiarism, and I'd had him before in a class where he also plagiarized, and the last time that he did it, he was unrepentant and was trying to tell me, oh, I didn't really plagiarize, you know, I, I just used these sources, and I was like, look, this is, this is really going to get you in trouble. And this time around, um, he didn't get angry at me. He actually was, you know, upset with himself for having fallen into the same behavior. So, you know, I think the first time he thought I was the bad guy for calling him on it. And we get angry about, about stuff like that quite often. Um, going back to this, so, so another answer that I have, and, and maybe some of you would have for why study this, well, it's great literature. I love reading Homer, particularly about this guy, Odysseus, who I you know, really admire. Um, so, you know, an excuse to, to do that sounds like a, a good pretext for me. Um, but I think another, perhaps better answer would be, in this great literature, the stuff that we call classics, what we're seeing are... Um, these great themes 
being explored. The basic themes about the human condition. So again, to go back to the question, of can we define anger? Um, we don't. We don't necessarily need to because we all do experience it, and we see it play out. Um, so. You know, when we go back to, say, Sophocles, there's a lot of things we can't relate to, I think, when we read um, Oedipus Rex or we read the Ajax, which I'll be talking about today. But anger at the way that people are treated isn't one of the things that we can't relate to. It's one of the things we can easily connect with. Um, the social conditions of the time, they may seem kind of weird to us. Their religious conceptions may seem, you know, really bizarre. Um, even you know the ways that, that these people speak and dress, but their their basic human emotions and their motivations that seems really relevant today. Um, now, one thing I should add too is we're not when I say the Greek poets, we're not looking at all the Greek poets. We're we're just looking at Homer, who's writing epic poetry, and at the tragedians, who um, are also writing in the form of poetry. We're not looking at comic poetry. That would be very interesting to do, but we don't have the time. We're not looking at any lyric poetry or you know, what's called gnomic poetry, where they're trying to convey wisdom like Hesiod's works and days. Um, why? Because this is already a lot to, to, to bite into in a one and a half hour session. So before we go into looking at, at there's, there's two plays, or not two plays, two pieces of literature I really want to, focus on um, the Medea by Euripides and Homer's Iliad. Before we look at those more closely, I want to make a few general remarks just to situate these. Um, in all of these works, we're, we're faced with certain key elements of drama. And I don't want to say that Aristotle had all the answers to these things, but this is one of the things in his poetics where he, he is very helpful for us. If, if we think about what a drama, whether we're looking at you know, today's procedural dramas like Law and Order or a sitcom or you know, a, a Shakespearean play, what are the, the common elements that they have? There were six that Aristotle identified. There's probably more than that, but, but three of them are particularly important here. One is plot or story. What, what is actually happening? Uh, Aristotle called that muthos. And this is a word we get myth from. It's, it's the, the actions that are happening, <clears throat> but they're happening through the choices that are being made by the principal actors. And if we think about action in, in poetry or tragedy, it's always action in relation to another person. There are some cases where maybe they're hunting and now it's action in relation to the wild boar that they have to hunt down or action in relation to the, the gods or the divine. But a lot of what's going on is back and forth interaction between people, uh, especially in the Iliad where it's a war. You know, war is people trying to do each other in. Uh, that's, that's the main action there. The next main element is what Aristotle called character or ethos. And... You remember back when you had to write book reports? Um, what's the theme? Who are the characters? Well, the characters are, are really central. And a, a good uh, work is going to confront us with characters who are, in a certain way, irreducible. They can be types, but they're not just types. So Oedipus, when we run into him, he is a sort of, you know, if we're reading the text rightly, he's a living, breathing thinking person who is going to make some bad choices and suffer horribly as a result, um, but in whom we can also see things that we admire, um, things that we feel dread at. This is, this is what these works were intended to, to do, to portray character. And how, how are people's characters revealed? Well, you know, think about how we reveal our character to, to each other. It's through our, our choices, through how we behave over time through the choices we make at critical junctures, where we could go this way and be a bad guy, or go this way and be somebody who's noble. Then there's also this element of thought. And I think this is something that, when we're younger, tends to turn us off from um, Greek epics and, and Greek plays. And maybe for audiences that spend a lot of time just watching 
uh, contemporary movies, it, it may be harder to, to read a Greek play as well. Because, you know, when you read, you know, here's, here's Aeschylus, the, the three, um, you know, plays dealing with, with Agamemnon through Orestes and the Furies. You read these, it's mostly talking, right? These guys, it doesn't even give you any stage directions because nothing happens on stage. That was one of the peculiarities of Greek drama. It's, it's portraying the action, but how does it portray it? Through, through speech. And the characters reveal themselves by telling you, here's what I'm going to do. And then, then they go and they do it. Um, and they, they take a lot of positions on each other. You're a jerk. No, you're a jerk. Here's why you're a jerk. Here's why you're a jerk. You know, we'll see a couple of these kind of passages. Um, and if it were, you know, if it were an action movie today, they'd just be punching each other. <laughs> or, or, you know, have any of you seen the, the Troy uh, movie that had Brad Pitt and I forget who else? It wasn't bad, right? It was fun to watch. Yeah. But it sure isn't Homer. No. Because, you know, Homer, now Homer actually does narrate some, some action in pretty graphic detail. He'll tell you, yeah, and then he shoved the spear through his neck and it caught him on the cheekbone and down he went to Hades. But he, he's not, that's not the main thrust of, of what's going on. It's mostly about the speeches. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is we're, we're looking at the heroic or the Bronze Age in ancient Greece. These, these characters that we're encountering in these tragedies and in the Iliad are all these, these um, you know, not necessarily heroes or demigods, but pretty close to it. They're these elevated figures, what the Greeks call the aristos, the, the best. Um, there's very little discussion of the ordinary person um, in, in most of these, a little bit more in the Odyssey, just with his household. Um, and, and the central period that most of this is focused on is the Trojan War, which is a, a really defining event for, for the Greeks. Uh, and then the aftermath of it in what, what were called the returns, you know, when these guys, those who don't die on the battlefield are coming home. The story of Jason and Medea that we're going to look at comes from one generation before Troy. Because Jason is, he's of the same generation as Hercules. And he's also friends with um, uh, Telamon, who's going to be the father of one of the key characters in, in the Iliad, Ajax. So that's a little bit earlier, and we're actually going to look at that one first. Now, in all of these, we're dealing with a culture that's, that's completely dominated by warriors and by conceptions of, of kingship and rulership codes of honor. It's a very masculine-oriented culture and not masculine-oriented towards the world of work. It's oriented towards the world of, of warfare. Yeah, And we get to see glimpses of the rest of the supporting culture. So we get to see them at their feasts and we get to see their interactions with um, household servants or you know farmers or or the the people of, of the things, but it, these are just glimpses. We don't get an awful lot of that. It's mostly focused on on these these um, these people at the apex of their society. And since it is a warrior culture, you know, you might expect that anger is going to be an integral part of it because anger has always been closely associated with dynamism, with yeah. battlefield courage. Yeah, with direction. The, yeah. Um, you expect a warrior to be, you know, at least if they're doing hand-to-hand -hand combat, to be pretty excited about what they're doing. And if they're not just, you know, completely shaken with fear, which a lot of them were too, then another common affect is to, to get riled up, to get angry. You see this even today with sports teams, you know. Um, I remember when I was engaging in, in things our coach would try to provoke us to, to be angry at the other team and that's kind of dangerous to do because then that leads to you know doing the wrong thing like fouls and uh, treating them badly but there's there's kind of an element to that to warrior culture um, contentiousness you know revenge and reprisal these are all parts of that as well but anger is going to play a more complex role in these stories and I picked the title to evoke two of the most important cases one of these is about somebody who's not a warrior. She's a sorceress, and that's Medea. She's married to a guy who's, you know, ostensibly a, a king, although he's not exercising any rule because he's been kicked out of his kingdom for the second time. That's Jason. Um, 
And she, but she is from a warrior culture. She's a princess. As a matter of fact, she's just two steps removed from the sun god. So we'll look at her. And then we're going to look at the, the wrath of Achilles. The Iliad begins by saying, let's talk about the wrath or the rage of Achilles. The, the very first word of the Achilles, of the Iliad, sorry. Uh, it's kind of funny trip slip there. The very first word is rage. Rage. <laughs> Old news, tell me of the, the rage of, of Achilles. So we're going to look at, at these two. If we have time, I'd also like to talk about a play by Sophocles called The Ajax that shows us some interesting depictions. And then if, if we have a lot of time, I'd like to talk about this guy Odysseus and how anger fits in with, with him. Now, there, there's certain big thematics. You know, you might say instead of having definitions, they have, they have sort of general themes that they're, they're dealing with. And we're getting more questions and problems than we're getting answers and solutions in the Greek plays. We're not getting a, a comprehensive treatment. These guys are not, you know, philosophy professors. Um, they're, they're people depicting human action. Um, but they are examining a few things. So one of them is the causes of anger. This is some of the first reflection in the Greek world about, well, what is it that actually makes us angry? What, what happens when we get angry? They tended to locate anger in the, um, the frame, which you know, doesn't literally mean the chest. I'm just pointing at the chest because this is where they thought it was. And you can translate that as mind or heart. It gets translated those ways. It's, um, it's where the thumos or the spirited element of us resided. And that's the part of us that would get riled up and angry. So they, they had a, a kind of location for it. I think a lot of us, I know I feel anger here physically. Um, I don't know too many people who like feel it in their little finger tip or mm -hmm. on the nose. Or, it, it tends to be a fairly large, you know. It's a personal thing. It is a personal thing. Yeah. Although it's, it, you know, with different, um, well, at least with this society, they tended to locate it there uh, as, as a general thing as well. Um, they also wanted to think about, you know, what is anger like? What does anger look like? Homer um, doesn't spend a lot of time talking about faces. He spends a lot of time talking about psychological things. Same thing with, with Medea. They have a lot of metaphors. Uh, anger is a heaviness. It's a kind of being weighted down. It's a, something fiery, something... It's going to explode. Yeah. And Achilles, actually, on, on, on one of the handouts that I have for you, Achilles says something quite interesting about anger. He says, if only strife could die from the lives of gods and men and anger that drives the sanest man to flare and outrage. He's talking about his own anger there. And then he says, bitter gall, sweeter than dripping streams of honey that swarms in people's chests and blinds like smoke. Just like the anger Agamemnon, king of men, has roused within me now. And that notion of anger as being sweeter than honey runs throughout the literature um, there's something about anger that makes it particularly seductive. This is why anger management is really <laughs> important, right? Because not only can, can people like lose their temper, they can even become kind of addicted. To well, if it's a society that that time of wars, yeah, wouldn't anger by escalating and by almost like giving such you know uh, elevation to it, yeah. give you the courage to do the things that they want you to do if you, if you sustain this anger? Well, you, can, you can do what you need to do in warfare without losing your temper. And for the Greeks... To overcome fear is what I mean. Well, yes Using and no. The, um, no. the trouble is, is that anger is unreliable. It has a tendency to spill over. And that's what we're going to see with Achilles. He has, he has an anger that goes beyond even the anger oh, yeah. of, of the gods, they say. Mm -hmm. And so he's being held up as a model of the ideal warrior type, but also being criticized by Homer at the same time as, as having gone too far. Because Homer will put these speeches in the mouths of other people. And then Achilles himself will say, well, it was a stupid thing. I shouldn't have done that, you know, around like book 18 or so. Um, so there's that. And then another element that's, that's associated with this is it's not just a, a culture of battlefield courage in facing the enemy, the Greeks were also almost obsessively concerned with this notion of right and wrong and justice. 
And anger can be um, a spur to actually doing justice when mm -hmm. it has to happen because you have to overcome fear. And it's, it's scary to confront people who are doing the wrong thing because they're already doing the wrong thing. Maybe they'll do the wrong thing to you in return. And we see this in the Greek plays. But um, anger also has a tendency, again, to spill over, to, to take what was originally just. Yeah, it takes a, an originally just case. You shouldn't have done that to me. And then it goes further and further and says, no, nah, I'm going to kill you. Now I'm going to destroy <laughs> you know, your very name. Um, so it, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It's, it's, it is. Yeah. It's, it's a, 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 that's And that's another theme is the morality of anger. When is it okay to be angry? How far should you get angry? When are you going too far with it? Um, usually it takes somebody else being on the scene to say, hey, buddy, you know, you're, you're screwing up. You're going too far with this. And then usually the person ignores it in, in the place. Yeah. I, you want to play? Um, I think it, uh, it walks hand in hand with, uh, as you said, being right. Yeah. Uh, we all have tendency to be right. And then, uh, when I feel that I am right, and I want to get this right into reality, become right in the reality, something blocks me that I cannot be right. Then I yeah. have, then the anger builds up, becomes an emotion, comes into action, gives this push to destroy these things that the block me from yeah. being right. And then <clears throat> it comes into action of breaking and then the anger comes out and uh, how strong this feeling of being right and want to show that I am right then gives me the stimuli to push that, my that is one of the dynamics uh, of anger there's, there's multiple ways anger arises but that is one of the ways that it, that, that it happens yeah you haven't used the word adrenaline in your no I haven't anger. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it seems to me that that would be a strong component of it, and that would be the part of it that would tend to go overboard. I mean, you've got adrenaline, and then uh, this sort of ethical issue, moral issue. Yeah. And uh, trying to keep those in balance, I think, could be one could be one of the challenges. That's something. I mean, we're not going to see them talk about adrenaline because they didn't. They didn't. You know, of course not. but they will be <laughs> talking. Not. They will be ta some of them will be talking about the physiological right. effects of of anger. But when us. they talk about something sweeter than honey and this, yeah. this feeling, and I mean that to me is a way, a cultural way of describing this adrenaline that sort of takes you out of yourself and makes doing this horrible stuff. There's also there's also the component of like meditating upon one's revenge. They talk about this a lot. I'm going to get that you know sob, um, and then thinking about that is <clears throat> is also pleasant. Um, and that, you know, that's one of the reasons why it become becomes you know this addictive loop that you want to get out. Isn't of. that a masculine type of thing? I mean, that's you know, an interesting to question. To go to go after you know what I mean to. Uh, I don't stand up for your myself, honor and to, you know, yeah, like, myself, I don't think so. room for humility or something. I don't think so because I, I, <laughs> I think that a lot of um, our, our conceptions about uh, what, you know, what men are like and what women are like tend to be very um, culturally uh, determined. And when you do comparative, you know, looking across cultures, you, uh, you can find that women can be just as angry, just as vicious, just as, sometimes just as aggressive uh, as, as men. It, it depends very much on the culture. So, like, you know, in, in, if you look at gangs, for example, and gang violence, um, men still predominate here in this society when it comes to gang violence. But in the last two generations, women have really come into their own, you could say. You know? <laughs> so you have these girl gangs that are, that are doing just, just horribly vicious things. Um, where the reaction tends to be is like, well, when women do it now, oh my God, that's a horrible, horrible thing. So Medea is, is held up as this, like, uh, just total aberration. When, you know, it's, it's not that. Male and, and female aggression sometimes play themselves out in different ways, but they, they're, both, they're both there. Somebody else had... I, I, I see it as a palette of colors that anger could be red, and as you get more angry, it could burst out 
like in flames and so forth. And, yeah. and then if you're able to control it, it can go into the gray area and down. I, I see anger as color, a palette. Yeah. I, I think we do have to be able to distinguish different modes of being angry. And this is where some of the later That's, philosophers are going to be helpful. Although at some point, when that color goes down, it's no longer really anger. It might be frustration. Well, well that's what you want to yeah. control. Well, yeah, you do want to get so, it to so, that level. So definitely. you bring it down to the cooler colors of blues yeah. and so forth. So which means I think got, artistically. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think there's something to to that. I mean, I, I, I'm more linguistic than, than, than uh, visual, so I, I tend to associate with things like you know the hothead versus the grudge holder. Those are very two very different ways of being angry. Mm. You know, but yeah, go ahead. I think uh, feeling anger <coughs> and uh, expressing anger are two different things, and they manifest yes. differently in men and women. Yeah. Women feel angry uh, equal to men, but the way men express their anger is different. Women can become very sneaky in expressing their anger, yeah. like flopped, yeah. and uh, they don't yeah. show aggressively as men. I think much of that depends on what society we're talking about, because we find some societies <laughs> where that's changing, the case. As you said, because yeah. society is uh, changing towards <coughs> men and women should be equal and yeah. should express the same way. So that's yeah, why well, that's the gang, good, gang that's women point. That's yeah. true. Women gang they are it's true. Now there's there's um two other themes that I wanna before we go into the Medea that I wanna highlight. <clears throat> one of these is the tendency for anger in one person to produce more anger in other people. There's a dynamic by which um it sort of spreads and there's this wonderful line in the uh the Agamemnon where it's a play by Aeschylus Agamemnon has returned home for after the war. Agamemnon was the, <clears throat> the leader of, of the Greeks against Troy. He gets into all sorts of trouble, but he gets into lots of trouble with his wife, Clytemnestra. And he got into trouble before he left because he sacrificed his own daughter, Iphigenia, yeah. so that the Greeks so the yeah. Greeks could <laughs> sail. And Clytemnestra, she is still angry with him yeah. after ten years. And she's gonna take revenge. Yeah. Um, and, and interestingly, in, in Aeschylus, it's not only the living who feel anger, it's the dead who feel anger as well. So <clears throat> Aeschylus is going to have Agamemnon get killed by the end of this. And when that happens, the chorus, um, Clytemnestra is saying, look, this is the right thing for me to do because of this and this. And the chorus is saying that was the wrong thing. And the chorus then says, where, where lies right? Reason despairs her powers Mind numbly gropes, her quick resources spent are thrown endangered and disaster near. Where can I turn? I fear. And the idea is that sometimes when you have these, these almost generation-long grudges and feuds and reprisals going on, after a while, it becomes difficult to tell, well, who... Oops. Everyone feels that they're in the right, yeah, but who actually has the yeah. right? It becomes very difficult to, to disentangle that. And that's going on in the Iliad as well. The other theme that I'm not going to talk much about, um, but we'll hit on in other ones, is the gods get angry a lot. And they get angry not only at human beings, sometimes for neglecting their sacrifices. Ajax actually manages to tick off a lot of the gods, including Athena, because the gods help out when we're fighting on the battlefield. Ajax is such a warrior that Athena is helping him out. And he's like, go away, I don't need you. And you, know, you, don't, you, don't, yeah, you, don't, you don't say that to a god. And you don't say that to Athena because she can get very angry. Um, and she's actually going to have a terrible revenge on him a little bit later on. But um, the gods get angry <clears throat> at each other as well. And... They get angry, well, you're supporting this guy, and I'm not happy about that. You're, you're keeping my champion from having the glory he deserves. Um, the, the, the Trojan War begins by anger between the goddesses over the, the apple that, that Discord um, in, introduces as a prize. And um, there's a point in the Iliad where actually Poseidon threatens to do the sort of thing to Zeus that Achilles is currently doing to the Greeks and to Agamemnon to be angry with him and remain so forever. He says, Zeus, if you cross this line, then there's going to be no coming back from this. 
And so the, the divine anger is also an important element of this as well. Let's look at the Medea now. Um, I've given you a handout that has you know, quite a lot of information there, but I'm going to kind of run through it pretty quickly. <clears throat> um, and I've got some, some, some stuff from the play that I'm going to, to read. Um, I'm going to start out with a line, actually, which probably exemplifies not just um, the Medea, but also a lot of other pieces. In the Greek, it's, it's said by the chorus, and they say, Dene tisorge kai dusiatos pele hotan philoi, philoisi sumbalos erin. And the, it's translated as terrible and hard to deal with is the wrath that comes when kin join in conflict with kin. But the, the translation there of, of um, philoi, philoisi, it could also mean friends. Yeah, or those who are associated with one. And what we see happening in the Iliad is this, this conflict of, you know, the philos with the other philos, the, the comrades, those who are associated with each other, who are spo- supposed to be fighting those Trojans over there. They end up doing a lot of infighting among themselves because of their, their anger and because of the kinds of guys that they are and what they do. Um, that's going to happen in the Ajax as well. And it's definitely happening here, here in the Medea, because Medea has, she has become the, <clears throat> the kin of Jason through marriage, and she's, she's had children with him. Um, she actually, at one point, says that bearing a child is, um, counts for three battles. <laughs> because, you know, it's scary to go into battle, and you might get killed, but having a child is like three times, the actual childbirth is three times as, as much as that. So she has gone to war for him. And she's not only like born in children, she killed her own brother. Yeah. She betrayed her people in Colchis. And she wasn't just betraying a bunch of schmucks that, you know, she, she's not, Jason tries to portray it like, well, you know, I took you to the big city. I took you away from these barbarians. And, and you know, her response is, I had a really good life there. I was a princess. I'm royalty. You know, you're descended from the gods in some way through some long, complicated genealogy. I am the granddaughter of the sun. And I fell in love with you and betrayed my own people so you could, you know, fulfill this quest for the golden fleece that you didn't have to. I didn't have to do any of this stuff for you. And this is how you treat me. And, and at the beginning of the play, she's in a, a terrible uh, state of, of grief and anger because Jason has betrayed her. But Go ahead. How could you feel sorry for her? I mean, her reasoning is so off. off. How could she feel like... This dishonor, what is it? This this insult or dishonoring? Well, as honor matters when she very went much. Ahead, now, how could it be really honor when she went ahead and betrayed her own family? She killed her brother. So what? What? Oh, she's coming from a bad place to begin with. So yeah, I mean, so she, to expect she, honor from him, she's kind of like her whole thinking is out of whack. That's not the way the Greeks would see it. See, but I yeah, yeah because and, they and you know she. Um, she did it for love. And then Jason will, of course, so anything say... anything goes for love. Well, in this case, yeah. She, she falls hard in love with Jason. And um, she makes her choices on, on that basis. And she still... Well, whatever she does, she remains you know, the, da- the granddaughter of the son. She remains royalty. So she should be treated with, with honor because of that. Can you give yeah. us a definition of honor that's working through these things? Yeah, I can't give you a it. definition because there is no definition. I can give you a characterization. Okay. The Greeks had this concept of, of uh, time, and time means honor, and it also means price, and it's, it's there in the word for revenge as well, um, timoresis, to, to inflict a penalty on somebody is to restore uh, honor that's been lost. So honor is... You know, this, this being looked up to, being treated in the appropriate ways. And it, it could be at multiple levels. So, you know, even, even within a, a poor household, you know, there could be honor between the husband and the wife, you know, in comparison to the household servants or the ox or something like that. And as you go further and further up, it becomes very contested who should actually have 
what kinds of honors. That's why the Greeks have so many conflicts, because there isn't a single code that says everybody should do this. And there's certain things that go along with it, like honoring um, uh, contracts or pledges or, or agreements that you enter into. So, Is it the same word used today? There's a variety of words, but they're, they're synonyms of each other. Um, Is honor based on class? It's connected to it. Mm. It's not based on it. Because you could be of a high class and be a dishonorable person. You know, but generally, yeah, the, the higher class are considered the aristoi, and they, you know, in, in the heroic age, they're earning that right based on their ability to defend their people and to provide feasts and, and do all these sorts of things um, to enforce their, their, their will, to enforce justice through the land. Um, and, you know, there, there's less honor at the bottom, but somebody could rise from the bottom and, and attain great honor. You know, yeah. Um, my assumption is that honor in these texts is not an abstract thing, but it always has to be in the eyes of someone or demonstrated in some way that there's some physical manifestation of the honor that you have. It's kind of both. I mean, in an abstract. I mean, it's it's a concept that you can you can like compare people back and forth, but it's it is also concrete. You know, I have my honor, you have your honor, this guy's got no honor, you know, he's lost honor, he gains honor, that, that sort of thing. Um, but it, you know, it's also something that is contested. A person can think that they have more honor than they do, or think that they have less honor, like Ajax, who kills himself, thinks that he's been totally dishonored by his, his own actions. Um, with Medea, there's an interesting parallel there because she, so here's, here's what happens is Jason and Medea are living in Corinth for a long time and Jason decides to marry the daughter of the king of Corinth. And why is he doing that? In his view, he's not actually wronging Medea, he's actually like helping out because now she'll be part of that, that big family and the kids will be safe because they'll have, you know, uh, stepbrothers and sisters. We're all going to be one big happy family. Oh, oh, and Medea is not having any of it. She, her view is, you are married to me. Now you've cast me off for this younger woman who is well connected. And you are not only harming me, you're harming my kids as well. We're going to be nobodies in this land. And her view is, you know... I'm the wrong person for you to do that to, Jason. Uh, not only because I've done all this stuff for you and you owe me, but also because I'm a powerful sorceress. Yeah. And I can enforce my will. So they talk about her as, as um, having this, this heavy-hearted anger, this barathumon organ, the two words for anger there. And she, she expresses the wish that she could die. Uh, you know, sometimes people get so angry that they wish they could die that the world could be a face for them. And then she says, I am going to have my revenge against Jason and against his bride. Now that brings her into conflict with the king because the king, who gets angry at now in return, says, no, you're, you're not going to you know, do anything to my daughter. you got to get the hell out of here. You're exiled. That's it for you and your kids. Get out of here. And she, now is where it starts to get very, very uh, twisted and, and wicked. This is where she decides... Um, that she is going to do as much damage as possible. Um, and she talks about this with the chorus. There's a confrontation between her and Jason, where Jason tries to say, well, look, I was trying to you know, look out for you. And then it breaks down into what almost looks like a typical domestic squabble. You're a jerk. No, you're a jerk. I did all this for you. No, you didn't do anything for me. I was the one who did all this for you. And they, they part on, on bad terms. Um, and then she secures herself a place in another Greek, uh, Greek land, and then she begins her revenge. And her revenge is to say that, I'm going to be reconciled. I, I've given up my anger. Jason comes back, and she says, I was wrong. You've got to bear with me. Um, I know that I sometimes lose my temper. Um, this is all for the best. You're the best husband ever. Um, I'm going to welcome your new bride. And I'm going to send her some gifts. So she does, and the gifts, of course, are poisoned. 
are they poisoned? Uh, nobody knows what, what exactly this is, you know, what, what was going on. But she puts on this, this uh, dress and she immediately begins burning. And it, it's a horrible death. Her, her father, the, the lord of the land, Crayon, he tries to help her out of it. He's stuck to it. He dies. So now she's taken revenge on the royalty. The way that she takes revenge on Jason is, and this is where Medea becomes sort of a byword, is she kills her own children. Huh. She kills her and Jason's children. Um, and, and why? Because, um, well, I'll read, you, I'll read you the line. The lines. She says, I groan at what a deed I must do next. I shall kill my children. There is no one who can rescue them. When I have utterly confounded the whole house of Jason, I shall leave the land in flight from the murder of my own dear sons, having committed a most unholy <coughs> deed. Um, and she, she goes on, the, the chorus leader says, I urge you not to do this deed. And she says, it cannot be otherwise. Um, the chorus leader says, will you bring yourself to kill your own offspring, woman? And she says, it is the way to hurt my husband most. Mm -hmm. So what we see here is a portrayal of anger taken to um, its furthest extent, except for Achilles in, in Greek literature. Um, now, later on, she will sort of reconsider. She goes through a period where she's like, am, am I going to kill my kids? And then she decides, well, you know, I've pretty much made things too difficult for them. They're going to get killed by the people anyway, so it may as well be my, by my hand. But then towards the end, she and Jason have another confrontation while she is flying off in a chariot driven by dragons. Um, and she tells him, yeah, I killed them to, uh, to you know, do as much damage to you, but you're the one who killed them through your actions. And what we see here is, what you're talking about with anger has a tendency to, to not only begin with something that might, where somebody might be right, but to like make us think that we're right the whole way through. And, rationalize anything. Yeah, and she, you know, she tells Jason, "Look, you're a schmuck, and you're gonna, you're gonna die <laughs> by yourself now, old, and you're gonna die with the 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 prow of your ship falling down, and hitting hitting you on the head, which is supposedly the way that he died. I'm going over to another place where I've already got some some uh, asylum set up, and that's that's where it ends. So what we have is this. Again, we don't have definitions of anger. We don't have a solution to it. But we have a sort of a cautionary tale. This is how far anger can go. Um, in, in the Iliad, we have um, Achilles. And Achilles and Agamemnon get into this fight because um, Apollo's angry. Apollo is angry at Agamemnon and the Greeks because... Um, his priest has been dishonored. One of the things that the, the Greeks were doing, the, you know, it wasn't just the Greeks and Troy. The Trojans had all these allies, and the Greeks were like picking them off one by one by one to try to isolate the city. And so, um, one of the, the cities that they took, there was a priest, and he had a daughter, and Agamemnon took this daughter as his war prize, as, as a slave, essentially, a concubine. And. Um, the, the priest comes to ask for his daughter back, and Agamemnon gets mad at the priest, tells him, get out of here, you know. You're lucky I don't do worse to you. And this sets things in motion, because now the god gets mad. And when gods get mad, then you really got to worry, because Apollo sends plagues, and so the Greek soldiers are now dying off. And they have a council, um, and Agamemnon is, is, is not really the king of all the Greeks. He, he sometimes acts as if he is. But he's really just the war leader, and the Greeks are there of their own free will, at least the, the noble ones, to try to, you know, um, fight in this common cause. And Agamemnon has this tendency to, to you know, place himself up a little bit higher than, than everybody else, and that's what happens. So, you know, they go into this council, and um, a, a seer says, look... You know, you got to give the girl back. Apollo's angry. He's not going to be satisfied until you do that. So what does Agamemnon do? He gets mad at the priest and gets mad at the seer. And now Achilles stands up and he says, come on, you know, you want this to work? What's wrong with you? Why don't you um, let the girl go and we'll even give you better stuff once we take Troy. You know, we're not that far away from winning this war. Um... 
just, you know, take one for the team, essentially. <laughs> and Achilles is, is in the noblest of the Greeks. So what happens then is Agamemnon gets mad at Achilles. And he says, yeah, that's easy for you to say. Um, you have war captives. How about I go to your tent and I take away your captive? Or maybe I'll go and do it to Ajax or Odysseus. So he's like, you know, this would be sort of like the president of the United States um, saying, um, I'll go to the Secretary of Defense and take all of his stuff. <laughs> or the Secretary of State and take all of her stuff. Um, it's, it's senseless, right? But Agamemnon is angered, and there's this line in there, you know, beware of the anger of great kings, um, because they'll, they'll do these kind of arbitrary things that seem to them the right thing to do, but everybody else, it's clear it's unjust. So Achilles, you know, ends up saying, you're not a good king, um, this is not the sort of thing that you should be doing, and I'm going to take off. I don't have to put up with this sort of nonsense from, from you. I'm, I'm here of my own free will. I'm your best warrior. You shouldn't be dishonoring me like this. And Agamemnon says, you can leave if you want. I'm taking your captive. And now Achilles, there's this great scene where he's, the, he's actually got his, his sword halfway pulled out of his, his sheath. And if he, if he actually does pull it out, he's going to kill Agamemnon. There's nobody else who can stand up against Achilles. Not, not Ajax, not Odysseus, certainly not Agamemnon. And he's debating, you know, there's a debate going on within him. Should he give in to his anger or should he restrain it and, and take another course? And uh, the gods come down because that's what it takes at this point. And Athena tells him, restrain your anger. Just tell Agamemnon what the consequences are going to be. And, you know, we'll, we'll sort this out. So he tells Agamemnon, if you do this, I'm not going to fight for you guys. You're going to lose. Because Hector is just about as good as me, and he's better than any of you, and it's going to cost you an awful lot. And Agamemnon basically says, you know, the equivalent of, screw you to him. <laughs> and then he takes his captive. So this is the wrath of Achilles that it begins with. And then, you know, there's a lot of killing, and a lot of fighting, and a lot of interesting conflicts going on for a while. And the Trojans start pushing the Greeks back further and further and further, to the, all the way to their ships. So Agamemnon finally relents. He says, yeah, that was, a, that was a dumb idea. I shouldn't have done that. Let's, let's try to make things right. Even when he's trying to make things right, though, he's offering all these gifts and saying, I'll give you my daughter. I'll give you, um, you know, citadels. Uh, I'll, I'll make you the richest man in Greece. You just got to gotta fight under me. And he sends an emissary to Achilles. And Achilles says, no, this is final. And Phoenix, who was Achilles' sort of, you might call him like stepfather or, or, or his mentor, he brought him up when he was little, says, this is, you're going too far. Not even the gods are so iron-hearted as you. Even they can change their mind. You, you, you offend Zeus, you know, make some sacrifices, say some prayers, maybe he'll have mercy on you. You, Achilles, are merciless. And Achilles says, well, that's, that's fine. Uh, and he treats everybody very nicely, but he then says, send them on their way. And the battle gets closer and closer and closer to now where the Greeks are literally on their last defenses. Um, and what, what turns the tide is that Achilles' best friend is, is Patroclus. And Patroclus says, let me put on your armor so I can go out and they'll think that I'm you and I'll fight and maybe we'll push these Trojans back. So they, they do that, and Patroclus is actually doing a pretty good job. He's, he's a tough guy in his own right, which is probably why Achilles liked him. And he's pushing the lines back, and then Apollo comes behind him and gives him a good whack and totally undoes him. And then Hector comes through. Hector is sort of the Achilles of the Trojans. He's the son of the, the king. Um, he's, the son, he's the brother of the guy who got them in all the trouble to begin with, Paris, who's not very good at, at fighting, but is good with the ladies. And Hector not only kills Patroclus, he strips him of his armor, which was, that was okay, but then he begins to desecrate the corpse. And that was a no-no uh, back in that time. And there's this big battle going on, and finally, you know, some of the Greeks come and they say, Achilles... Uh, Patroclus is dead, and we're trying to get his body back. Ajax has been out there <laughs> fighting for this, and he can't get the body back. Um, maybe you want to, you know, 
I know that you're not going to fight for us in general, but maybe on this this occasion you can make an exception. So Achilles gets up, he goes out, he gets the body back, he, he fights, and um, now now he's he's uh, posed with an issue. Should I should I change my mind? And he does. He actually relents, and he and Agamemnon make make uh, friends. But the reason why Achilles is doing this is he wants revenge. He wants, he wants to kill revenge. Hector. Yeah. And the, the defeat that he imposes on Hector, which is going to lead to the very end of the Iliad, is again excessive. It, it shows you how far anger can go. He kills Hector, which again, it's a war. These are Greek warriors. That's not a problem. Then what he does is he, he takes Hector's body and he drags it behind his chariot. <laughs> This is one of the, the, the ways to show contempt, you know. There's, there's uh, not much left of the body by the time that he's, he's done with it. And he's got it in his tent. And the, the Iliad actually ends with King Priam coming, the, the king of Troy, of the city they've been besieging this entire time, and um, going to his knees and hugging Achilles' knees and begging for his son's body so that he can bury it. And Achilles now is, is actually overcome with awe at this gesture. And he and Priam, um, they, make, they make friends. And he gives them the body back, they break bread. Uh, Priam sleeps under his, his tent, which that would have been a pretty big thing, although he leaves about midway through the night because he starts getting cold feet, um, taking the body with him. And that's where, the, that's where the Iliad ends. It's the story, with all these twists and turns along the way, of the terrible wrath of Achilles and how far it went and how many people had to die along the way. So again, we have another cautionary tale. Um, where are we? Oh, we're, we're at 1135. So we could do one of two things here. We could just do like sort of free-form discussion or I could tell you a little bit about the Ajax and then go into that, that free-form discussion. I think you did a nice job. To... Oh, yeah. You did a nice job of telling that story. Is it the Ajax? Yeah, I like it. Because it's a long story. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the Ajax is, is a different one yeah. that, that's connected to this, that involves some of these same characters. Isn't there one point in the, uh, in the Iliad where um, Agamemnon comes in and says, oh, you know, I'll, I'll make it up to you, I'll give you all these things, I'll even give you Grisace back? Yes, yes. And, and, and I haven't even slept with her, he says. Exactly. She's as pure as yeah. the day I got her. And and Achilles still says no. Yeah. Now he's getting more than he started with, but his anger, Way more. His, his pride has been yeah. wounded yeah. so much that there there seems to be nothing that anybody could do right. to uh, assuage his anger. Yeah, and he's yeah. got he's got his his you know, whatever you want to call him, this guy Phoenix, who, who nur didn't nurse him, but he, he talks about, when you were a little baby, I would cut pieces of meat and put them into your mouth, and I ruined many shirts by you spitting up wine on them. Yeah. And he's got this guy trying to reason with him, um, saying, you know, you, you got you to gotta let this go. Um, Ajax actually tries, too, by saying, forget Agamemnon, that guy's a jerk. Look at the rest of us poor Greeks. You're our buddies. Mm -hmm. we're, we're your buddies. You know, we've done all this stuff together. Mm -hmm. Are you going to just leave us here to die? I'm a great warrior, but I'm not, I'm not quite you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Achilles still won't, won't, mm -hmm. won't budge, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Is there any, any place in the Iliad uh, in which this irrational anger is attributed to the fact that it's really reflecting the divine anger? And that's what gets it to this irrational. No. Is there something there no, that suggests that it's because the gods are behind this that it goes over the top? Or no, the, ar the argument that Phoenix says is, look, even the gods can be assuaged. Oh, okay. You know, you ought to be more like the gods. Okay. Okay. Um, what's wrong with you? You know, you're, you're like a one of a kind here. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and uh, no, it's purely Achilles okay. um, in this case. Ajax... Um, do you guys want to hear about the Ajax? Yes. yes. Okay. okay. So Ajax was this great warrior too. It, that's and in a what's that in? in that's in a play called the Ajax, oh, the and Ajax. also in some of the the, the other epic um, cycles as well. So and it's mentioned also in the Odyssey. Um, so Ajax is is another one of the great Greek fighters, and he does a lot of the fighting in the Iliad while Achilles is sitting in his, in his tent. So 
So he's talked as, as, as like a tower, as the bulwark of the, the Achaean troops. Um, after Achilles dies and they get his armor back from Hector, there is a contest as to who's going to get the armor. And this is a huge honor. And there's a vote that's taken, and there were two main candidates for it. Odysseus, another great warrior, and Ajax. And they give it to Odysseus. Ajax and his brother and all of his men suspect that there was some backroom dealing going on, and they get extremely angry at, at uh, Menelaus and Agamemnon and at Odysseus. And Ajax now goes into a sort of rage state and decides he's going to kill them all. And he probably could have, because he's, he's the second best fighter of the Greeks. That's big Ajax. Yeah, that's right. There, were, there's a little. This almost sounds like the um, the cans, you know, little Ajax or big Ajax, you know, the cleaning agent. Um, so, and actually, you know, Ajax, in a way, this is really kind of a silly comparison, but he's sort of like the cleanup guy throughout the Iliad. Whenever they're in trouble, Ajax is there to scour the battle lines, you know. So Ajax decides, I'm going to kill them all, and Athena comes and takes away his mind. So he goes and he rounds up, he, he goes into a state of insanity, he rounds up sheep and goats and, and cattle and brings them into his tent and he slaughters some of them and ties some of them up and tortures them and he thinks that he's doing this to Agamemnon and Odysseus and then Athena, after all this carnage has happened, puts his mind back in and Ajax is devastated because what he's done is just a disgusting, dishonorable yeah. thing. Um, meanwhile, everybody else has found out that, hey, this guy wanted to kill us. <laughs> so he's got a double problem there. The dishonor to him is so great that he decides, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to kill myself with the very sword that Hector gave me. Because he and Hector had fought hand to hand and come to, a, to an inconclusive point and then exchanged some, some, uh, some items back and forth. His wife pleads with him, don't kill yourself. If you do, my child is going to be an orphan. I'm going to be a nobody. They're going to make us into slaves. And he says, yeah, okay, I won't. But eventually he's overcome, and he does kill himself. So that would seem to be a bad end in itself, but the play doesn't end there. What's really interesting about it is his brother, Telker, the archer, shows up now because he's heard that Ajax has died. And Telker is, is on his way to the body, and Menelaus, uh, Agamemnon's brother, the guy who was married to Helen, the guy who, you know, the whole war is being fought over, he's there by the body, and he says, you're not burying this body. And Telker says, no, I am burying this body. This is my brother. And, and Menelaus says, he was a traitor. He was going to kill all of us. He was in a terrible rage, and you're not burying him, because he's not even really a Greek anymore. So they're starting to get into conflict, and they go back and forth. Talker, you know, they have sort of, you know, like a pushing match almost with words. You know, you're not the guy to take me down. I'll take you down even if I don't have any armor on. Uh, and they go back and forth like this. Then Menelaus leaves. <laughs> Agamemnon comes on, and Agamemnon says, you're not bearing the body. And again, they go back and forth. And finally, Odysseus shows up. And Odysseus is going to be the guy who will fix things. So the chorus says, Lord Odysseus, just in time to untie this dreadful knot, unless you wanted to make an even worse tangle of it. Because Odysseus, remember, Ajax was going to kill him too. So Odysseus says, um, you know, what's going on? And he says, Agamemnon, you haven't been insulted. I can understand a man in hurling insults to those who've done the same to him. And, and he says, um, can I help you out here, Agamemnon? Can I give you a little advice? So Agamemnon says, yeah, you're the smartest guy here. And Odysseus says, I beg you in the name of the heavens not to be so merciless as to refuse that man his burial. Don't let anger grow so much in your heart that it overpowers your sense of justice. So we have an appeal going on here on the part of Odysseus. And then Odysseus says, he was my enemy too. The worst of the whole army, particularly since I won Achilles' armor. But even though he thought of me as his enemy, I would not betray his honor by denying that he was indeed a very brave man. 
So Odysseus is, is a guy who's able to keep a sense of perspective and bring a sense of perspective to the others. He says, the bravest of all the Greeks that came here, all except Achilles. So to insult Ajax is to commit an injustice. Because by doing so, it won't be him that you'd be insulting, but the gods and their laws. The law is clear on this. To insult a noble man, even if he's dead, and even if you hate him, is to commit an injustice. And then Agamemnon, you know, sort of sliding back into the typical us versus them, I'm angry sort of mentality, says, what's going on here? You, you didn't like him either. He, was, he wanted to kill you. And Odysseus says, that's right. But this is what justice actually requires. This is what nobility requires. So if I, the person that Ajax wanted to kill the most, can say this, you can certainly say this too. And it comes to a conclusion with Odysseus actually making friends with Telker, the, the archer, the, the, the brother of, of uh, Ajax, and Ajax being buried. So there's a case where anger, which led to just horrible things, you know, and, and could have broken the entire Greek army and resulted in all of them dying, um, is headed off by this guy, Odysseus. Ajax remains so angry that when Odysseus in the Odyssey descends to Hades and speaks with the dead, he talks with Agamemnon and he talks with Achilles. Ajax still won't talk with him. He's going to retain that, that anger within him for the rest of time. And he, he, re, he remains kind of a, um, a uh, like Medea, or, or as Achilles could have been, a warning about uh, how far anger can go. So that's, you know, that's, uh, I suppose if there's any lesson to, to derive from this, it's anger is needed, but anger is very dangerous. And it can easily spill over and go too far. And, and I guess the other lesson would be, be nice to have a guy like Odysseus around when you're angry, wouldn't it? Um, so what do you guys make of, of this? We have a little bit of, uh, of time for a sort of open discussion, we have about 15 minutes. What I like is that they're such great teaching lessons. Yeah. And you, to, to bring up children, reading this, there are so many different points of view. You can argue for and against all the characters and everything they do. Yeah. You, and, and none of those things would be wrong. They would just be different points of view. And it would show, it would bring out character in the person, I think, as they were, as they were growing up. Um, it, it would be shown how they react to the various characters in these plays. Yeah. They are splendid. To bring up awareness. Uh, you, you, you know, in other words, if you used it for that, you teach children to be aware of, you know, who would you like to be like? Who, who would you in your life want to uh, um, imitate? Odysseus or an Ajax? Or a, what do you think you want to see happen? Yeah. Or combine parts of them, perhaps. You know, be like him in this way, but not like him in this way. What were you going to say? Actually, to confirm what you said, uh, that was exactly my thinking. These are like a code of uh, conduct. Yeah. And uh, the final part about uh, the conversation between uh, <coughs> Medea, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it says that um, the gods could not do anything for Jason because yeah. uh, he himself was an oath broker. Yeah. He was what? Oath breaker. Oath breaker. Yeah. Because he was somehow in wrong. His curse to Medea did not work, could not work. Yes. So I think that it is telling us that if you are already in wrong, that is the conclusion that you will get, that is the result you will get, and there is nothing the gods can do for you because you are also in wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you understand them? I think that before you ask. Yeah. Go ahead. Because what. Um, what struck me in reading this and also in going over this is the role that the gods play. And I, yes. I, I feel like the free will is... Mm, I mean, they may think they have it, but then the gods will come in and direct things off in a different way. But here in that last episode, um, uh, the gods will not intervene for someone who has already 
broken and oh, so there's yeah. a point at which they back off and let things transform. I think there are certain rules like uh, the the creation is uh, built on certain principles. Yeah. So the gods also work based on certain principles. They have laws and principles. They play favorites have, though, um, yeah. like uh, Eric. Um, there's a scene early on in the Iliad where Aphrodite is a big fan of Paris because he's a nice looking guy and she helped him out and all that and he's a terrible fighter <laughs> so he's fighting Menelaus and Menelaus of course is, is thrashing him and so he's about to die and Aphrodite covers him up and takes him away and Athena then says alright Diomedes you're a great fighter I'm going to help you fight a god you can go after Aphrodite um, and, and he does. He wounds her, you know. Uh, now, why does he wound her? Because she's messing around in, in affairs that she's not. She, she should have let help Menelaus kill kill um, Paris, but she she didn't. And the gods do play favorites, but it's it tends to be kind of capricious. Mm -hmm. When the gods do get involved, then hum, it's not that human beings don't have free will. It's just that what they choose to do may not be effective. So, like when Patroclus goes out and he's fighting. And then finally, Apollo comes in and unbinds him, and like his armor actually falls off of him. Um, there's nothing that that it's not that Patroclus didn't choose to be out there fighting of his own free will, but it's just not going to be effective. Hector kills him. Um, when Athena comes down and tells Achilles, "Don't kill Agamemnon," he could have still killed Agamemnon. He actually says, I'm going to listen to you because it's best to listen to the gods. Mm -hmm. So there is still a, a lot of element of, of free will. It's just within a, a scope in which the exercise of free will may not turn out to be effective. Yeah, because you don't know what they're going to do next to the gods. They're so, <laughs> they are, well, they're so changeable. And they're at odds with like each other. <laughs> so, like, you know, Odysseus just wants to get home, and he, he, you know, he screwed up in a moment of anger again. And revealed his identity to the Cyclops when when they gouged his eye out, you know, as, as he's like leaving. In his anger, he says, "Oh, by the way, my name isn't nobody. It's Odysseus. That's the guy who put your eyeball out, your one eyeball that you had. Good luck, buddy." And you know that lays him in for Poly Polyphemus saying, "Hey, uh, Dad, because his dad is beside him. Take care of this guy." And then. You know, Poseidon is angry with Odysseus the entire Odyssey, mm -hmm. and Athena is, is trying to help him out, but he doesn't get home for another ten years. You know, which makes Penelope angry, one would think, but you don't you don't find that in. You know the anger the anger that happens there. She's more in grief. Telemachus. One of the things I really love about the Odyssey is the first couple books that are concerned with Telemachus, because here you have a young man who's grown up with this you know, absent but super famous father with a mother who's trying to remain faithful to him and all these guys around, you know, trying to marry his mother, eating them out of house and home, and now he's like coming of age. And he has a lot of what the Greeks call thumos, this spirited element. He is, he is a warrior. And he, he says, you know, um, boy, if I, was, if I was a little bit older, I'd kill all of you because you guys are, are really doing the wrong thing here. And the suitors now, then they say, he goes and he says, I'm going to go to Sparta and, and consult with some people. So some of the suitors say, we've got to kill this guy. <laughs> because he's not going just to, you know, talk with Helen and Menelaus. He's actually going to get a whole bunch of guys to bring in to fight us. So we better kill him when he comes back. Let's, let's set a trap for him. And you've got anger going on there. And... Um, You know, Telemachus is still angry through, to, to the very end. Because you know? <laughs> these guys have been, these suitors are, you know. Vultures. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. They're vultures. They're, they're swooping in trying to snatch up the, the rich guy's place. Uh, and he's got this, this dad that he's never actually met, you know, in the background. Um, just waiting for him to show up. That would, I would be really angry in a case like that, you know. Is there any instance of what one might call productive anger in any of these things we've been Yes. Looking? So um, when anger, and this is a fairly rare case, is actually being you know, harnessed 
for the the, um, the sake of justice or to you know do what you're supposed to do on the battlefield, then it's productive. But it has such a tendency to spill over and go beyond. There's a line where, where Telker in the Ajax, um, he's being criticized for being angry, and he actually says... Um, it's okay to have anger when justice is on your side. Um, this is paraphrasing, of course, but he... Uh, ah, here it is. When justice is with you, then anger is justified. Menelaus is criticizing him. He says, your tongue feeds your temper with a fierce anger. So he's saying, you're out of line. And, and, and Telker is saying, this is, this is a, a case where I should be angry. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, if you if you stick to to the justice you started out wanting to achieve, then you know. And but you're angry, and you you you. It's but tough you don't to do. let it spit. It is yeah. tough. Yeah, oh no, I'm yeah. sure that. I mean, we can see it today. You know, Telker is kind of a good contrast to his brother Ajax. So Ajax is is uh, going to kill all of them. I don't. You know, anybody who gets in my way, you're dead. You know. Especially if you keep me from getting to Odysseus or Agamemnon or Menelaus. Um, That's when his mind has been... Well, his mind is taken away so he can't do that. Okay. He has the intention of doing that. Then Athena takes his mind away. Um, just so, and and is, you know, only the part of his mind that keeps him from confusing uh, sheep with, with people. Because he does exactly to those sheep what he wanted to do to the, to the people. Telker is just saying, look, Menelaus... I'm going to bury my brother. If you get in my way, you're making me mad. If you get in my way, I'm going to kill you. I'm not going to kill all of your guys. I'm not going to kill anybody else. But on this one, like you were saying, with, with, I've got this thing that I'm going to do. And if you're going to get in my way as an obstacle, then I'm, I'm going to get angry. That would be a case where anger would be justified if, if it's the right thing to do. You know. As you said in the beginning, um, like... Uh Everything is like a pl- uh, drama. Like yeah. Mm-hmm. Drama has a plot. Right? Yes. Uh, so the plot has, uh, there is a protagonist and there is an antagonist. And there is a conflict, of course, between the protagonist and antagonist. Yeah. So the desire, whatever uh, the protagonist is wishing for, whatever antagonist does is blocking. So it will be the conflict between the protagonist, antagonist. As you said, I think uh, just anger is, justified anger is when uh, when the anger or the, uh, how can I say, the revenge or whatever you yeah. do, whatever action you take in order to uh, bring into reality what you wish for yeah. um, is directed towards that thing. It's like, I'm not killing all men, but only you, because you are the only one. Uh, yeah, so it's focus. <clears throat> it's, uh, oh, yes, focus. For example, Medea could just hurt Jason for what he did. That was wrong. Yeah. Because you're married and you're supposed to stay, you know, faithful yeah. to your spouse. But he betrayed her. He went with somebody else. So what he did was wrong. <laughs> but Medea's action, like killing, killing everybody, children, yeah. was kind of <laughs> yeah, and rationalizing it onto putting the guilt onto everyone else. <laughs> you know, like it's putting the guilt of killing her children, and rationalizing and saying, "Well, you, it's your fault that they died." Yeah, she in the, in the play, she actually comes out and says, "You're the one who killed them. Yeah. It was your hand." Um, in a way, she's right. Yeah. Because by going with somebody else, it's like he left his position as a father to those children also. Yeah. You cannot bring somebody else and other children into a unit that is a husband and wife and family, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, but that's not the only direction yeah. that her response or anger could have taken. Yes. Yeah. That, you know, that's what the, I said. Uh, yeah. the, uh, he didn't directly. I mean, he may have gotten her okay. angry enough to think of doing something like that, but for her to actually go through it and kill the children wasn't him. There's some real pathos in the play, too, because the children are crying out 
they have lines while they're being killed. They're not, they're not being killed on stage because nothing ha actually happens on stage in these in these plays. Same thing happens. The innocent in, always. Yeah, same thing happens in the Agamemnon too. By the way, with Agamemnon, he is um, enfolded in this this robe as he's going to take a, a bath to cleanse himself of the guilt of of, of blood from Troy. Clytemnestra has, has designed what we nowadays probably call a straitjacket. A robe with all these ties, and they tie him up, and then they, they slaughter him. Um, and you, and he's he's shouting while it's happening. And then the chorus are like debating: Should we do something? I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't. You know. And by the time that they actually arrive at a decision, they're like, "Well, it's kind of late in the game. I think he's dead now." <laughs> Same thing happens with the the other one as well. We People are, and, and that's kind of a good thing. To, to call to mind too. There's this tendency when we're faced with other people's anger and they're going overboard to like be aghast and say, I, I don't know what I should do. You know, if you have an Odysseus there, Odysseus says, "Hey, knock it off." You know, he's he's the one to go up and maybe smack somebody in the face and say, "Get a hold of yourself." But most of us, when we are confronted with horrible, you know, excesses of anger, we don't know what to do. I remember the first time I saw that. I was staying with my uncle, and I was 14 years old, and um, we were staying in a, in a boarding house because I was doing some painting work with him. And there were these two women that were there, and in a boarding house, everyone eats at the same table. And these two women didn't like each other, and they had some history. And one of them said something about the other one's mother. And uh, suddenly, like, one of them got up and knocked the table over and chairs are flying and she's there just strangling this this woman and my uncle who was a little guy he's he's over there trying to grab her arms and pull them off this lady was this lady was very large you know like not not just you know like fat or anything but just very muscular and of course you know I was a 14 year old kid and he, he described it, because I don't remember, you know, what I did. He said, your eyes are just, like, bulging out. And I was like, Greg, help me, help me. And I was just, like, transfixed. I couldn't, you know, I didn't know what, what the hell to do. Because luckily then I, I, I did get up, because that lady would have killed the other lady. Oh, so you helped. See, you got it. Well, eventually, yeah, but not, not, not as quickly as I should have. And I think there's a lot of that when we're seeing other people's excessive Anger, where, where it quits just being an emotion and becomes something that like possesses a person. Yeah, and now you're seeing it on Twitter. I yeah. know this is an aside, but is revenge with the mafia the same as anger? Well, that's a good that's a good question. I mean, it could be. Um, control. They got control. It. They do it so that they could have the power. Mm -hmm. it, it could it's be. I, power. I suppose it could be either. I mean, imagine if you had. Let's say we we're all a bunch of mobsters, and um, I'm I'm the boss, and um, you you're the the renegade. You did something wrong, and I know that you already don't like her. So, for me, it's just it's you know like a purely cold, calculative decision. Wow, we got to do her in, but I'm going to pick somebody who I know is going to get angry about what happened because then I can rely on them to actually. Do them in. It could be, you know, different. But this goes on generations. Some of them, they were revenge. Yeah. Until it, they, it, they, the families don't know which, what the real cause was. Well, in those organizations, yeah. they just have to, they just have to put the feet. It's like all of these kinds of organizations, the power and fear. Yeah. So what that they can, that's right. What's interesting is, is when anger of that sort is able to be overcome, which does happen in some of these Greek. Um, plays and, and uh, epics, there's always some sort of, it's not always from a god, but it, there's always some sort of something coming in from the outside and saying, hey, let's get a sense of perspective. You're all probably got some, you know, some things that you're right about, but this, this anger by itself has gone too far. And then it usually does involve something religious. Usually there's a ceremony of some sort. Um, great example of that is the end of the, the um, trilogy for Aeschylus, where um, the, uh, it's called the Eumenides, where, where Orestes has killed his mother. Orestes was Clytemnestra and Agamemnon's son. And he kills his mother because she killed his father, but now he has blood guilt for killing his mother on his hands. And the Furies are pursuing him. And there's, there's the first law court, where Athena is arguing the case 
and Orestes is arguing the case for him, and Apollo is the judge. And they decide, all right, in this case, we're going to put things to, to a stop, because otherwise it would just keep going on forever and ever. Um, but there has to, the, the thing that puts an end to the anger of that sort is either people recognize, look, it was, it was stupid and our self-interest um, demands that we work together like Agamemnon and, and uh, um, Achilles, or um, somebody comes in from the outside like Odysseus and says, you guys are out of control, you got to back off on this, let's all be friends, or the gods themselves come in and say, you got to knock this off, we're, we're calling a an end to this sort of thing. It's interesting, It's because um, what we're talking about here really is a rather simplistic eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth yes. kind of revenge, yeah. Yeah. aren't we? And with the mafia too. And But there are characters dotted around in here, as there are in, in, in everyday life, yeah. who are thinking at a higher level. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard of Kohlberg's Oh yeah, the six stages. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you know, this is three, and there's six levels, so there's a heck of a lot of... Yeah. Um, higher thinking that that can be applied, and that that's what that's what why we I think identify with this because on some level we we're all still kids who who want to have revenge, mm -hmm. and you yeah. can do it you can do it um, through the, reading these these. Oh, so we stories. vicariously uh, and, and participate in it. Yes, I would think the only way you really can get to some kind of conclusion is also to. Um, all of all of us to possess some humility. Mm -hmm. With a, a lack of it, makes us just yeah. go off. You you need to at some point. So with that, the you know. Um, it depends on how we conceive of humility. If if we think of humility as just being lowered, then yeah, it'd be the opposite of, of honor. Um, if we think of humility. The way that some other people have, like having an honest self-assessment, yeah. um, knowing who you actually are, and not not going beyond that, then it, it would be compatible with that. Or well, rec recognizing you know? your own, you it, sort of what he said something. Albert uh, Camus said something about yeah. that. You know, he recognized his own um, uh, things that he did that were unjust, and he recognizes his own failings. Is what he says. And you have to recognize your own. You know what I'm saying? Before you go off and want all of this justice. Right. Because you're not perfect. Right. And many people you love aren't perfect. There is something of that in some of these characters where they'll say lines like that, like, um, well, none of us are without transgressions or, or we've all done some things wrong. Um, but it's pretty rare. And they're usually not, li and they're usually not listened to. Yeah, and we need uh, more. Isn't that part of a God's sort of job to help them gain insight? Well, but well, they're, 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 they're gods not very themselves. good gods. <laughs> the, the, gods them, the thing is, the gods themselves are yeah. always fighting with each other, or, you know, they're coming down and they're going ahead and making love with somebody, so there's somebody's half God on earth, yeah. <laughs> half, half, half human. But they're not, <laughs> they're Hera, not very good. Hera's a great example. I mean, when she pursues Hercules, she just wants to kill him because. Zeus has gone, you know, Zeus is always cheating on her, and, and this time she's really going to get this, this guy. With the Trojan War, Hera's anger goes so far that she is said, what, I think Zeus says to her, you will only be satisfied if you eat the flesh of the, the Trojans. So she's not going to be any help, you know, um, not on that, that respect. When it comes to, like, helping the Greeks, of course, then she's the one who says, I like Agamemnon, I like Achilles, please don't let them kill each other. You know? But they're, they're, they're only selectively helpful, I guess. Oh, 